The number one cause of death in the United States and in the world is heart disease. Now lumped into this category is high blood pressure, AKA hypertension. So high blood pressure leads to stroke and heart attacks, and that's what often leads to death. There's actually two broad categories of hypertension, but we'll focus on the one that the vast majority of people have, 90% to be specific, and that's something called essential hypertension, AKA benign hypertension. What causes essential hypertension? If you said eating too much salt, well, you wouldn't be wrong. Salt is definitely a big part of the problem. But an even bigger driver of essential hypertension, which no one really talks about, is insulin resistance, which is what happens when you eat too much processed food. In general, processed food has lots of salt, but it also has lots of added sugar. The sugar actually ends up being a bigger problem because that's what leads to insulin resistance. Now, insulin resistance not only leads to hypertension, but all of the other chronic diseases of metabolic origin. So things like high cholesterol, diabetes, fatty liver disease, of course, heart attacks, and is it even been strongly linked to dementia and some types of cancer. For every five point rise in blood pressure, the risk of death increases by about 10%. Why? When you measure your blood pressure, you get a top number and a bottom number. That top number is the systolic pressure and the bottom one is the diastolic pressure. So that systolic pressure indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against your artery walls when the heart contracts. The diastolic blood pressure, the bottom number, indicates how much pressure your blood is exerting against your artery walls when the heart relaxes in between beats. 50 years ago, there were about 50 million Americans who had hypertension. Now, it's 100 million. And why is it so hard for so many people to get that blood pressure down? Well, lowering the blood pressure number is actually the easy part. I could prescribe you five different blood pressure pills and make those numbers look really nice, you know, get those numbers nice and low, but that would cause all sorts of other problems, right? For example, feel weak or tired or lightheaded or make you feel dizzy. It can even lead to fainting, muscle cramps, or having uh, electrolyte abnormalities like high or low sodium or high or low potassium levels, depending on which medications we're talking about not to mention the potential for allergic reactions. In general, lowering blood pressure is a good thing, but there's still a 1% risk of death for doing so. A good example is when older people who take blood pressure medicine, they can faint and hit their head and die of brain hemorrhage, or they could have a fall that causes them to break their hip, and sometimes that ends up leading to their death. After all, falls are the leading cause of fatal and non-fatal injuries in older adults. So there's a reason why there's increased mortality in older adults whose blood pressure is less than 130 as a result of taking blood pressure medication. And it's no wonder why people want to lower their blood pressure without having to resort to medication. But is that even possible? Absolutely, for most people anyway, but I'll come back to that. Most people in the United States are being treated for mild hypertension, defined as systolic pressure of 140 to 160, or diastolic pressure of 90 to 110, are taking some medication. But patients with mild hypertension show no benefit from blood pressure reduction in terms of numbers of strokes and numbers of heart attacks and numbers of deaths. So fixing the numbers doesn't fix the person because fixing the numbers isn't addressing the root cause of the problem. Now, if you wanna look at a country that did a great job in reducing blood pressure and reducing stroke, take a look at the UK where they had a 40% drop in stroke rates between 2006 and 2012. So what was their magical solution? they forced food companies to decrease the amount of salt allowed in processed foods. It worked because they targeted the root cause of the problem. Now the FDA recommends that we consume no more than 2.3 grams of salt per day. And for those with hypertension, no more than 1.5 grams per day. Any guesses as to how many grams of salt most Americans consume on a daily basis? 6.9. But what about way back in the day when our ancestors who didn't have freezers or refrigerators they had to salt cure their meats to preserve them. They consumed over 15 grams of salt per day. Does that mean that their blood pressure was through the roof and they were dying of stroke left and right? No, because healthy kidneys are actually quite capable of getting rid of salt from the body by dumping it into urine. But the kidney's ability to get rid of salt from the body diminishes when there's too much insulin resistance going on. When people have high insulin levels over time, they develop insulin resistance and that causes the blood pressure to go up. So eating a low sodium diet 
will help lower the blood pressure, but it's only a partial fix. There are two main reasons why added sugar from processed food raises blood pressure. One is because the higher fructose loads from added sugar end up being rapidly absorbed to the liver, where it's the liver's job to metabolize it. Now in that process, more uric acid is produced and that's not good. When this happens, there's less nitric oxide being produced. When there's less nitric oxide circulating in your blood, your blood pressure goes up because we know that nitric oxide actually lowers the blood pressure. The second main reason is that consuming added sugar leads to higher insulin levels, which causes there to be more smooth muscle in the arteries of your heart and kidneys, which means your arteries, they start to narrow over time, resulting in higher blood pressures. And this is what also leads to heart disease and kidney disease. And that's why you see so many people who have high blood pressure, they also have kidney disease. So the ultimate solution is to cut out processed food. But changing what you eat is not the only thing that you can do to lower blood pressure. Exercise will help you get there as well, especially if you're hitting 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity workouts. And a third thing that you can do is intermittent fasting. So it's when you're eating. So the intermittent fasting, it has the same health benefits as exercise, and that includes lowering blood pressure. Now to understand why, Let's look at our parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system, AKA our fight or flight response. The reason why endurance athletes have a low resting heart rate is that they have increased activation of their parasympathetic neurons and their hearts are also more adaptable to stress. Perhaps you've heard of something called heart rate variability, which is the variability in the time interval between individual beats. For example, if your heart rate is 60 beats per minute, that doesn't mean that there's exactly 1.0 seconds between every beat. That interval can vary from maybe it's 0 0.08, excuse me, 0 0.8 to 1.2 or something to that effect. People who are healthy and fit usually have a high heart rate variability, which means that their heart is very good at changing its rate in response to environmental stressors, such as exercise. So that's endurance athletes that we're talking about. And if you look at the other end of the spectrum, people who are very inactive, they have a lower heart rate variability. Same goes for patients with heart failure. In fact, it's very low in patients with advanced heart failure. In rats and humans, intermittent fasting increases heart rate variability by increasing parasympathetic activity. How does it do this? Let's look at exercise once more. So we know that exercise stimulates the brain to make more BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we know that BDNF plays a role in causing the low resting heart rate and the lower blood pressure of endurance athletes by enhancing that parasympathetic tone. And just like exercise, intermittent fasting also enhances BDNF production in the brain due to the ketones that are generated in that process, specifically beta hydroxybutyrate. But also it has to do with the stimulation of the AMP kinase enzyme. So in summary, the best way to keep the blood pressure normal and to avoid the number one killer in the world is by focusing on what you eat, meaning unprocessed food, when you eat, intermittent fasting, as well as exercise. And if you want the complete guide to intermittent fasting for beginners, make sure you check out this video right here.